Uh, a question that I had been asked made me wonder whether I needed to clarify something about this matter of debts. I could easily see how someone got perhaps an impression that I did not mean to convey, after all one is always pressed for a time. I do not mean, did not mean to imply, if that's the impression I conveyed, that installment buying is, is what Paul is talking about with, oh no man anything. That doesn't refer to buying things on installments. I mentioned installments because they are so expensive and there's a, another way of avoiding that in many cases. But if a person buys a car or a house on installments, that isn't what uh, Paul is talking about, oh no man anything, but when payments are due and they are neglected to be paid, that's where Paul's admonition comes in. I have an American Express credit card that I use all over the world in charging hotels and airline tickets, but that's not in a sense a debt, that's a contract, that's an orderly arrangement. Now, when the bill comes in and I refuse to pay or don't pay for one reason or another when they do, then that's another story. So, please do not feel convicted when you buy a car on the installment plan or a house or a mansion or something. Now, uh, I want to see what I can do with you this morning. I'll have to give you some fragments that I pick up and try to do it in a reasonable order to be, try to be helpful. You recall, uh, we were left on verse 6, and thy father which is in secret. Some years ago the Lord made tremendously real to me the passage in Jeremiah 23, I think it's 24, verse 24, Do not I feel heaven and earth. You have no idea what that has meant to me. The Lord gave it to me specifically for travel, but it applies, of course, in any situation. I have no problem whatever to recognize the presence of God, irrespective of whether I feel it or not, I know he is there. So when you go to the closet, to the secret place to pray, you don't have to worry about not feeling his presence. What you do is, Father, I thank you for your presence. Your feeling has nothing to do with it. He says that he is in secret, he sees in secret, so acknowledge what the scripture says and then pro proceed on that basis irrespective of how you feel. No, it says we see it in secret. That, of course, is the Father's observation. And you can sometime, if you're in distress, go to the book of Exodus, around chapter 3, where God says, I have seen their affliction. I heard their cries. I know their sorrows. A marvelous picture of the awareness which God has of our needs. So when you go alone, don't wait for the feeling. Acknowledge what is written, that's the fact, and then build your prayers upon that. Shall reward thee openly. Now that is the Father's admonition. Uh, excuse me, the father's disposition. The father, as a father, has a father's heart, and he is kindly disposed 
to respond to our request, but do remember, but seek ye first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness that I gave you an hour with yesterday, there are firsts here. But as we comply with the laws of his kingdom and respect his sovereignty over our lives, then can we come in confidence because under those circumstances, the Father is kindly disposed to respond to our needs. Set the sparrow to the robin. I would really like to know why those anxious human beings rush about and worry so. Set the robin to the sparrow. Friend, I think that it must be that they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. Now Jesus referring to the sparrow said, Are ye not much better than they? So bring yourself into alignment with the laws that govern his kingdom. Subject yourself in obedience to do his will because he is sovereign. And all these things shall be added unto you. Now I would like to touch a bit on what we call, I think mistakenly, the Lord's Prayer. I think it is unfortunate that this prayer which the Lord gave has ever become known as the Lord's Prayer. For the simple reason, it's not the Lord's Prayer at all. It's the prayer which Jesus gave to his disciples, to the sons of God, as a medium of expression what they should feel. This is really not the Lord's Prayer. It is the disciples' prayer. You have the prayer of the hypocrite. You have the prayer of the heathen. In between, you have the disciples' prayer. When ye pray after this manner, pray ye. This is the prayer of the sons of God. It's not the Lord's Prayer. Now, I'm not going to change it because that's unchangeable. But it isn't really strictly correct. The fact is the Lord couldn't pray this prayer. He could not pray and forgive us our trespasses. He had none to forgive. It's the Lord's Prayer only in the sense that he gave it to us. But in reality, it's the disciples' prayer, or better still, the son's prayer, the prayer of the sons of God. Now, you recognize that the Lord was a man of prayer. We read, for instance, that Jesus rose early a great while before day and went out into a desert place apart to pray. Now, I may here differ somewhat with the psychologists, but uh, I can't help that. I believe, and I think I see it in Scripture, that there is something to the morning hour in approaching God that is different and likely to be better than any other time. God God sent his prophets early. You read the biographies or even autobiographies of men and women in the history of the church who have left a mark whose ministry and fruitfulness continues after their departure. They were invariably men and women who met their God early in the morning. Now, while the psychology says, well, some people are made up differently, they do better at midnight than they do at six, and I don't question that, not at all. But still, 
I think there is something to the morning hour the other hours do not have. Be that as it may, I used to be the kind of a feller, uh, late to bed and late to rise. I could be up till 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, but don't you bother me in the morning. I wanted to sleep till the sun was up in the sky. Do you know the Lord dealt with me about that? The Lord dealt with me about getting up early to meet him before the cares of the day press upon the mind or fill the mind, before the body and mind and the spirit is weary from the day, while our faculties normally are at their best, they are the freshest, I think we'd all agree with that, the Lord wanted me to be an early getter-upper. And I struggled so hard to get up early and, and, and couldn't do it. At night, you couldn't get me to bed. In the morning, you couldn't get me up. So the Lord dealt with me on this. Now I had been seeking the Lord every Wednesday night. I was going to work as a draftsman in New York City. I made patent drawings for the U.S. government. Uh, every Monday night, I had set aside for the uh, Wednesday night. I had set aside for the Lord arbitrarily. We had Tuesday night Bible study in Brother Swift Church. We had Thursday night prayer meeting. And the Sunday services, Saturday night street meeting, Saturday. Wednesday night was free. And Wednesday night I set aside for the Lord in fasting and prayer and nobody could move me. That was my night with the Lord. That was the Lord's evening. And I held to that. But during that time, the Lord dealt with me about getting up. Well... I needed help. I tried the alarm clock and that thing would go off and, you know, you turn over and shut it off and go back to sleep. That was it. So I said to the Lord, Lord, the alarm clock doesn't work. So I'm going to ask you to wake me up tomorrow morning at 6 o'clock. Now, to me, 6 o'clock was early. Today, it's late. When I'm at home, especially, now when I'm meeting, in meetings, I don't do it as much because I don't go to sleep after a meeting. Last night it was one o'clock, I still was wide awake. But at home, and especially in school, when you have a routine, you know, and you live by the clock, it's much easier. And uh, then at school, my, my day usually starts about 4.30, 5 o'clock, I'm up and I'm about my knitting and so forth. And uh, I said, Lord, tomorrow morning, please wake me up at 6 o'clock. Now, that was early, then. Well, I was awakened by a blue jay. Now, a blue jay doesn't sing. What does he do? Well, he makes a racket. Can those fellas make a noise? A blue jay was screaming or raggeding away on a tree outside my window and the scamp woke me up. I went around my room looking for something to throw at the beast. I had a piece of soap in my hand, but it was too new to be thrown away. I was going to throw it or try to throw it at that. <laughs> And in the process, I saw, I looked at my clock, it was six o'clock. The Lord sent the blue jay to wake me up. Now, you can think of that what you like. I'm just telling you what happened. Well, I couldn't get any, couldn't get at him, but I went back to bed, had another snooze. Mm hmm that night, I apologized to the Lord. I said, Lord, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. Tomorrow morning, awaken me at 6 o'clock. 
Now, I lived in a rooming house with some old, a very old couple, the quietest people you'd ever want to live with. You never heard them. And yet those people, the man and his wife, they argued. They woke me up with, with a red-hot argument right outside my door. And did they give it to each other? They woke me up and I got my Dutchman up. Well, I said, I'm going to quit here. This is no way to treat a rumor. Hey, they're waking me up. I pay my good money for their rent. They don't give me a chance to sleep. Those uh, inconsiderate so-and-sos. I looked at my clock. Six o'clock. The Lord used their argument outside my door to answer my prayer. Now, don't start an argument and say it must be the Lord. <laughs> I do not mean it that way at all. Well, I went back to sleep. Mm -hmm. That night, I apologized to the Lord. Forgive me, Lord, please wake me up at six o'clock. Now, you can believe this or not. I say many things that are hard to believe, but they are true. Not everybody believed the Lord either, did they? I was awakened by an automobile crash. A big bang. I jumped out of the bed to look. Now, I couldn't see the cars. But I heard the crash just around the corner, and in front of the house there were the wooden spokes from the wheels. This was in 1926. They had still wooden spokes. The wooden spokes of the wheels were lying in the street in front of the house. I heard the smash over there, though. Didn't see it, but heard it. I looked at my clock, six o'clock. Oh, brother, that's too early. I went back to bed, went to sleep. <laughs> yeah. That night, I said, Lord, I am ashamed. I am not going to ask you to wake me up. It hasn't worked. He worked, but I didn't cooperate. I said, Lord, I'm asking you to make me get up at six o'clock. Make me get up. That was a challenge. And I woke up at six o'clock with such a terrific stomach ache that I made a beeline for the bathroom. And by the time I came back, I was awake. <laughs> and stayed awake. And the spell was broken. And since then, I have been an early riser. But I get to bed on time. I have to. I'm very, very careful not to linger at nights. I go out, hold meetings. You come back from church, 10 o'clock. Now, Brother Butler, would you like some apple pie and some... No, no, thank you. I'm going to go right upstairs. Oh, come on, let's have a little fellowship. Well, you can't afford it. Can't afford it. This is a very, very disciplined life. Believe you me, folks. Walking with the Lord in this area demands tremendous self-discipline. I almost live by a schedule. Uh, just have to watch certain things. People do not always understand, but that is, that is the price uh, you, you have to pay. Now then, before I uh, use more time... I'd like to give you a few principles from the Lord's Prayer. Now, this Lord's Prayer, as we call it, uh, is a most remarkable bit of literature. First of all, let's notice something. Have you noticed that in the Lord's Prayer... The personal pronoun is always in the plural, never in the singular. Give us our daily bread. Deliver us, and uh, us this, and us that. How come? There's a principle there. In true prayer, 
There is no room for selfishness. You see, this prayer is chucked full of principles. Now, those of you that have my notes and the Lord's Prayer, you can see it for yourself. I, I'm using them here, but I'm only calling out some things. There are principles here. Now, to me, the Lord's Prayer has a twofold purpose. It is given to us as a medium of expressing what we ought to feel. I pray the Lord's Prayer many times. Not in an ecclesiastical way, you know. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy will come, come, round the room, bum, 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 Sometimes I pray only fragments because of their tremendous implication. But more than that, we have here the embodiment of principles of prayer, principles that govern all kinds of prayer by all kinds of people for whatever need. That's right. So you have here always the plural personal pronoun indicating that there is no room for selfishness in true prayer. It's not the case, oh Lord, bless me, Hans, Fritz, Rosemary, us four, no more, in Jesus' name, amen. Bye-bye. No. This prayer includes others. Also, there is a place for forgiveness and forgive us as we forgive others. In other words, in effective prayer, there is no room for an unforgiving spirit. If we want prayers to be effectual, we cannot afford to harbor malice and the like, anger, an unforgiving spirit against our brothers and sisters. We must forgive first before we can expect to be hurt. You know, uh, I used to work in New York and uh, there was a brother with me. And he was German, and one day we had a red-hot German argument. Both of us blew our tops at each other. It won't take time, the reasons. And as either providence, or bad luck, or good luck with heaven, somehow we landed next to each other at the altar in the church that night. He was here, I was here, and during the day, we really gave it to each other. You know. And, well, neither one of us could pray. So we grunted, you know, the Pentecostal fashion. Hallelujah. Hmm. <laughs> Lord, hallelujah. Amen, amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The Lord dealt with me. You get this thing straightened out with him. I tapped him on the shoulder. I said, brother, would you mind coming downstairs? I'd like to talk to you. Well, all right. Ooh. We went down. I apologized, asked his forgiveness. He had reason to do the same with me, I think, more so. If I explained it to you, you agree, but why take this precious time? Oh, he said, well, I'll forgive you, but I want to tell you it'll never be the same again between you and me. And it wasn't either, but I did my part. But when I went back to the altar, heaven was open. My, I could pray. Him, hallelujah, glory, glory. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Then he packed up and went home. 
There is no room for an unforgiving spirit. Now let's look at this prayer. Uh, and uh, as I told you, I was sitting up with the Lord by night, and that's how he unfolded the thing to me. I hadn't read it, hadn't heard it, but that's how it came to me. Now, we are not going to read it, uh, just to save the time, but uh, I'll tell you what we have here. This, this prayer has four different scenes. S-C-E-N-E-S, scenes, pictures, panorama, scenes. There is a domestic scene, there is a royal scene, there is an earthly scene, and there is a triumphant scene. Four sections, four scenes in this prayer. Now, I'll, I'll touch on some of them. The first one, the, the uh, domestic scene. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's the domestic scene. Here is a reference to the family, to the father, and to his residence. Our, that's the family. Our father, that of course is the father. Which art in heaven, that's his residence. Now there is truth in this. The Lord's Prayer begins with his family. Our effective prayer necessitates the recognition that we as God's people belong to the same family irrespective of our denominational dog text and ecclesiastical fences. There is only one family which God has. In heaven there are no assemblies of God people. In heaven there are no Elamites. Glory is right. <laughs> In heaven there are no four square or three square. No Presbyterians, no Anglicans, no Germans, no Frenchmen. No north nor south. You probably recognize that today by his spirit, God is in the process of breaking down these foolish differentiations that separate God's people and keep them from fellowshipping with each other. There is one family. All who are born again through, by the Spirit, through faith in Jesus Christ, all who are truly saved are God's family, past, present, and future. And that family ought to be in harmony and fellowship regardless of the particular denominational group or non-denominational group they belong. The Lord's Prayer begins with the oneness of the family of God. In heaven there are no Elamites and A.G. or anything else. Thank God those things will all be behind. 
there'll be only one family. I hope you understand me right. Our Father. Now, the Father whom I address is also the father of all his other children. So here what we have is the recognition of the oneness of the family of God and the recognition that God is the father of us all. In Germany, a lady was greatly confused by this denominationalism. She wanted to be in the right group and prayed that the Lord would show her which denomination was the right denomination. She had a dream. In the dream, she was going to a far-off place, had to take a ship, went down to the harbor, and saw all kinds of ships, the Baptist ship, Methodist ship, Pentecostal ship, other ships, people were arguing with each other on the ships. I'm getting off this ship. I think that's the right ship. Over there they were getting off that one and went to another one in great confusion. And she stood there perplexed, wondering which was the right ship. Then she saw another one painted white, and its name was Christ. Then she knew it was not a question of belonging to any one particular group. It was a question of being found in Christ. And that is the truth. Our Father, which art in heaven. Do you notice the prayer does not begin with a shopping list? It begins with the oneness of the family. I want to be at one with all of God's people, whatever denominational tag they wear, I don't care. If they belong to the Lord, we be brethren. And the other thing simply does not matter, should not affect our relationship at all. There is only one body, one church, one faith, one God and Father of us all. So here we have this recognition and this relationship to God as our Heavenly Father. Our Father which art in heaven, the implication here is reverence. See, which art in heaven. The thought is reverence. When we approach the Heavenly Father, there should be a reverential approach in our prayers. Now, we can be ever so familiar with God in one sense, but not this cheap buddy buddy type of a thing. He's our Father which is in heaven. We need to approach him with reverence. Hallowed be thy name, worship. Worshipful or reverential worship. Have you ever tried worship? before you pray. Do you notice the order here? The prayer does not begin with, give us this day our daily bread. Oh no. Worship takes precedence over petition. Uh, you girls, before you show the Lord your, your knee coming through the stocking, and you fellas, before they show the Lord the holes in your shoes, don't right away hit them over the head with the stocking or with the shoes and say, hey, God, you... No. Do a little worshipping. 
Father, I thank you for what you are. You know, worship does wonders. It opens up the heart of God far wider. I came home from a trip, South America, and didn't bring anything to my girls. I forgot why I didn't have it or no opportunity or something. Anyhow, I came home and I said to my little girl, Norma, who was always very affectionate and so appreciative of everything, I said, normally, I'm so sorry I couldn't bring you anything, or didn't, I forgot which, this time. She climbed up my, on my lap, put her little arm around my neck, and said, Daddy, that's all right. You know, you are the best present you could have brought home because you're the best daddy I ever had. Well, I knew that. She wasn't telling me anything. But when she said that, I could have gone to one of us in Philadelphia and bought a store out and put it on the lap, if you know what I mean. Try worship. I don't mean flattery, no. Oh, no, 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 no. Not using worship as a means to pry something out, you know, like a, like a, a, a wife will say to her husband, you know, you're a good husband. And he, knowing her, will say, well, what do you want? A new hat? Uh, not that kind of a thing, but sincere worship. Folks, it works wonders. Worship takes precedence over petition. It comes in this model prayer before the shopping list. Try to observe this order, not mechanically, but observe its principles of priority. I was attending a fairly large young people's rally, and the leader called me up from the audience and asked me to lead in prayer, which I did. And I started out something like, now I don't remember the exact uh, manner, but I'm giving you the picture. Father, we want to thank you for your goodness and your wonderful works to the children of men. And I went on praising the Lord a little bit for what he is, you know. Then I switched into the prayer requests, went back to my seat, and the, pray the preacher got up and in a rather cynical way said, huh. Huh. When you pray, you don't have to give to God a three-year course in systematic theology telling him what he is. He knows what he is. <laughs> that was a shot at me. That was a missile. Well, of course, uh, sort of ridiculed me, but I thought, preacher thought. I wasn't giving God a three-year course in systematic theology. I knew God knew better who he is, but I'll tell you something. God loves to hear when we acknowledge his attributes, acknowledge who he is. He loves to hear from our voices what we think of him, and it is an Excellent prelude to petition. Uh, hallowed be thy name. Aren't we told in Philippians to bring our request before him with thanksgiving? What are you going to thanksgiving for? What, what about thanksgiving? Oh, you give thanks for what he is. You give thanks for his goodness in the past. You mix it all up with true worship, and it puts power effectiveness in your prayers. Worship takes precedence over prayer. And when we worship, first, prayers need not be nearly as long, nor are they likely to be as long. Somehow you can... Uh, present your prayers in a condensed form with much greater effectiveness. Worship 
takes precedence over petition. Then, the second scene, Thy kingdom come. Oh, I pray this many times. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Now, this is the royal scene. We have here a reference to the king, to his kingdom, and to his subjects, and we are the subjects. Thy, that's a reference to the king. Kingdom, that's the sphere of his rule. And Jesus said, the kingdom of God is within you. As far as I am concerned, this is not merely a reference to the rule of God over the whole earth, though I think that is included. But it is not included to the exclusion of the kingdom of God within us. When we say, Thy kingdom come, we are saying, in effect, I'm recognizing your sovereignty over my life. Thy kingdom come in me. Lord, extend your rule in my life. Exercise your sovereignty in my life and your purpose for my life. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come in my goods. Establish your complete reign in their lives. Bring every faculty into subjection to your government. Thy kingdom come. All this has terrific implications. Thy kingdom come in me. Thy kingdom come in my body. Thy kingdom come in my spirit. Thy kingdom come in my life. Bring me under complete subjection to your sovereignty that all of your purpose be fulfilled in my life. Now, there is, I think, a connotation here about the millennium, God's rule over the whole world, but not to the exclusion of us. This is a personal prayer. Thy kingdom come. You know, I had a struggle with something while I was here and, and before already. About next summer, uh, I had been asked in Indonesia to visit the island, the Celebes, and... Uh, uh, what uh, used to be Borneo, uh, and uh, I just uh, didn't want to. Uh, they're so far out, and uh, the time would be the worst uh, weather of the year. If I've tried that once before. We left on a flight from Makassar, that's... Uh, the Celebes, and uh, they only had a, a DC-3 stripped-down version, the code that they called them. And before we took off, or when we took off, the left engine coughed and coughed and sputtered and coughed, and they kept going, and they took off with this coughing engine, which I didn't like. And we were gone for, oh, I don't know, an hour and a half or so over very high mountains. Very high. And lo and behold, the other engine coughed and stalled. Stopped. Now we just had the one engine left that coughed and take off. And I didn't like it one bit. Well, the pilot turned around right away and headed for home. But we had one engine. 
And those Indonesians, they all rushed over to the one side. Everybody wanted to see what was doing there. Wondered how that pilot kept that thing even. My first question, will this thing get over those high mountains and one engine? It did. The DC-3, you know, was some plane in its day. But they were old creatures now. Now, finally, the airport came into view. Will he be able to land on one engine without turning over? This is Garuda Airways, and Garuda doesn't have a good reputation. I don't like to take Garuda when I don't have it. They're not trained too well. They don't keep their equipment the way they should, because, of course, when we arrived, we arrived all right, but when we arrived, the thing went on fire. We had a reception committee of ambulances, fire engines, what have you. As we stopped, the thing started to flame. Could have happened out there. So I have no uh, particular taste for going out to those far off islands. And uh, only yesterday, on the way back from Rochester on the three o'clock bus, did I agree with the Lord. I'm going to go out to the islands. Thy kingdom come. Hear what I mean? Thy will be done. There are other factors involved. In earth as it is in heaven, in other words, completely. Now the third scene. Uh, and, uh, oh, Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Now I read to you. Now we go as far as lead us not into temptation, but deliver us, it should read, I understand, from the evil one. Now this is the earthly scene. The earthly scene with its daily needs, its material needs, its spiritual conflicts. Only now is their prayer offered for our personal needs. First thy kingdom come, but seek ye first the kingdom of God. So give us this day our daily bread, prayer for the material necessities of life. I don't think this word bread should be limited in connotation to what we call bread. Uh, Isaiah said, Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread? He doesn't mean literal bread merely. Bread here stands, I think, in general for the material necessities of life and should not be limited to, what shall we say, wonder bread. You know, there is a wonder bread. And that wonder bread is really wonder bread. The wonder is that anybody eats it. <laughs> Rubber bread. I don't know why people eat it. I wouldn't. Not even if I were a... Never mind. <laughs> Give us this day. You know what I see here. You might not agree with me, but I agree with myself. And is it my fault if I'm right and everybody else is wrong? Give us this day, this day. You know what I think? And I don't blame you if you don't follow me. I think this prayer was meant to be a daily prayer by God's children. When you understand that you can readily see why this could be so, it says, give us this day. Well, then tomorrow you have to pray again, give us this day. And the next day, give us this day. 
When you understand this prayer, it is a marvelous mode. That isn't what I want. What word do I want here? A marvelous medium of expression into, uh, with words into which you can put anything whatsoever that you want. Give us this day our daily bread. Now, I don't think you pray that at 10 o'clock at night. I think you pray that in the morning. And I am inclined to think this was intended to be a daily morning prayer helping God's children to express themselves to him in the proper manner. And forgive us our debts or sins as we forgive our debtors or those who have trespassed against us. There needs to be a forgiving spirit. And this often involves even restitution. Uh, the spirit of this prayer necessitates making restitution because we cannot be right with people or be right, let's say, with the school unless restitution is made. Sometimes school have students that, that uh, not only cheat but steal. I think any school sooner or later has a thief among them as they have other characters. And there, there comes a time when such a person will have to make right what is wrong. That doesn't have to be merely money. It can be other things where we need to make restitution in a sense. Say, for instance, a girl has a boyfriend in school. Now, I don't know how you folk get along here. I haven't observed. I haven't watched. I haven't seen. But I suppose there are... Uh, would be most unusual. Yes, you know. <laughs> All right, a girl gets a letter from her boy. I don't know whether that's permissible or not, but they get it whether it's permissible or not. They get them anyway. Well, now, I haven't got a letter here. Well, here is something that will do. All right, and the girl just got a, a letter from her boyfriend. And... Class bell rings, she puts it down in the, uh, sits it back in the envelope, puts it on the table and goes to class. The roommate comes in, sees the letter. What have been doing? I've been reading the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> huh? It's a wonderful prayer, isn't it? Sure is. Hallelujah. <laughs> I guess I'd better be going, roommate. I have to go to class. Comes a time when you're seeking the Lord. You pray the Lord's Prayer, Our Father. And that thing stands before you. That letter stands there. 
And you might say, oh, that's the devil disturbing my prayers. I rebuke thee, Satan, in the name of Jesus. And when you keep still, there is that letter. And I guarantee to you, all my time, if you want to move on with God, you'll have to say, mate, I have to have a talk with you. Oh, yeah? You know the letter you had that lying on your table? Yeah. While you were in class, I read it. I want you to forgive me. Now, what she'll say, I don't know. Oh, yes. Oh, that dollar we snitched out of a roommate's pocket while he was in class or someplace. Oh, I am only borrowing it. But somehow it never goes back. And even if it does go back, sooner or later, as you move on with God, You'll have to straighten that out with your roommate. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. We'll have to close. I have to break it off. More fragments. What shall we say? Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. In Elam. As it is in heaven.